me ask you a question. When you were, because one of the fascinating things about your story, and I, I have so many questions, Brian, so, uh, or Major, whatever, what, what, what do you prefer that I call you, sir? Brian, Brian's fine. Brian's fine. Um, the, um, the, the kind of dichotomy of your life um, after all the events that happened to you, uh, you know, after your issue with the war, uh, but once you came back to the States, as serving as both an SR-71 pilot, but also the flight, uh, also the pilot for the chase planes to take the, uh, the pictures of the plane. Like, you know, that's, that's a fascinating sort of double, like kind of like, you know, Bruce Wayne, Batman kind of lifestyle. Well, I do, you know, I had a real passion. I tell, I tell people this in my talks, I had a real passion for photography. When I first got in the Air Force, uh, I started with one of those little Kodak Instamatic uh, click cameras that you could fit right in the little cigarette pocket of a flight suit when I was in pilot training. And uh, the thrill of getting your wings and, and flying jets and just being up in the air. Uh, and then, and then of course, having an interest in, in photographing it kind of went together. It was like icing on a cake. Mm. For me, so I, I never saw it as uh, two uh, vastly different uh, endeavors. Mainly because I wasn't a very good photographer. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no <laughs> no plans at that time to be a professional photographer uh, in any uh, way. So it was just a natural progression of wow, this is so cool what we're getting to do, and I must record this somehow or get some memory of it. I did not imagine I'd be doing books or speeches. We didn't have uh, computers and, and uh, uh, slideshows and, and PowerPoints or any and Photoshop or any of those things. So it was a very natural progression of um, wanting to photograph what was a, a, an incredible, uh, a powerful subject to me, the, the planes, and especially if you can get the planes in flight in the air. And as the each um, new assignment I got in the Air Force, I went to the A-7 uh, to the A-10 and did different things. I, I tried to figure out ways to do my photography better, and I was learning. And now, flying single seat jets, you 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 can't really carry a camera on much and do do much uh, photography. So I, I was pretty limited in the A10 and the A7. So so, um, so you flew the the A10 tank killer? Yeah, I was in the very first A10 squadron, actually. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, when I was in A7s at Myrtle Beach, uh, they announced the A10 uh, was coming, and we were going to be the very first squadron to go operational. And I remember, I remember when we only had four jets out on the line, and uh, we were all going through training. <laughs> we were kind of writing the book on the airplane. So, um, but you know, I I liked uh, I I became the unofficial squadron photographer. So when everyone had to get their picture for the uh, squadron board in front of the jet. They said, "Hey, well, I'll, I'll let Brian do it. He's got he's got a new telephoto lens. We'll let him." Do it. <laughs> and it was uh, it was fun for me because I found a real uh, powerful statement in those kind of pictures. And I just found I just the joy of photography for all the things that it is sure. for uh, many different people, regardless of uh, subject. And I again wasn't very good. I didn't understand so much of it. I was so self taught and everything. And I. Uh, I met people along the way. I, I picked their brains. I, I used to ask a lot of questions, read a lot of books. And uh, it took me a long time to figure out some things uh, that, uh, you know, because cameras got more and more automated. And you thought that that would make the pictures better automatically. And in fact, it, it didn't. Um, you had to have a basic uh, understanding of what, what it was doing. So mm -hmm. uh, then when I went back and got all that. Um, never had any real, uh, say, formal training. But uh, photography and flying kind of went together for me. So it wasn't, it was by the time I got to the SR 71 and I was around the most elegant aircraft ever built. Sure. Uh, then I was really trying to, you know, improve my photography as shooting Kodachrome slides. I've got really good Nikon cameras and I was really uh, aware of uh, the photographic uh, excellence that you were trying to attain. And I, I, uh, knew several of the prominent aviation photographers of the of that day mm -hmm. of the time. they came some came to Beale to do pictures of us and i i went up and introduced myself i said i've seen your books i've seen all your pictures and i would like very much to pick your brains about uh this is something i want to do when i get out of the air force i thought uh aerial photojournalism would be a, a wonderful thing for me and it was for several years yeah uh, when I got out of the Air Force, I, I did a whole 
uh, uh, winter training season with the Thunderbirds, and I did a whole air show season with the Blue Angels. And I did uh, about 15 different Air National Guard units and Air Force units uh, flying, just getting to fly in the back seat of so many different airplanes and uh, do photographs. And I kind of did everything I wanted to do. And, and it, there came a dead end one day where there was no need. Um, the internet had exploded by then into mm. a megaverse of any photograph of any plane you would ever want has already been done a billion times better than you will ever do it. So why? <laughs> so there was no market or, or real uh, a career in, in making poster prints of jets in flight it, because there were 10 million of, of those out there that you could get on the internet. So I loved it. I, I uh, satisfied all my post Air Force flying needs and, and had a camera in my hand. Excuse me. And then it, it just led me back to my nature photography. When that was all done, I had done the Blue Angels, the Thunderbirds, the world's fastest jet. Uh, and I really... Uh, as I, as I quit flying in the 90s, I, I hung up my spurs. I said, I'm, I'm not going to do more flying. I really got into my uh, hiking and outdoor stuff. And again, it was just a very natural progression. Yeah, yeah. I give talks today. I've done several that are kind of a fun hybrid talk that says, how did you go from the cockpit of jet uh, airplanes to... Uh, right, from, from butterfly to blackbird. Yes. And it's a it's a fun talk. I I I'm, I made it uh, real interesting for certain camera clubs and uh, uh, groups who are are into photography. And it's a very natural <laughs> progression to me. I see the birds as airplanes out there. I see them as flying creatures. And uh, to be honest, uh, I'm having way more fun the last fifteen or twenty years doing birds than I ever did doing jets. They they have way more personality. They're way more <laughs> excited. They uh, and don't get me wrong, I, I mean, I, I was building model airplanes as a kid and I always loved airplanes, but there's something about the birds that uh, much more difficult to get a good shot. You're not in control of any of the uh, parameters. Sure. And when you do get it, one, it's a real gift uh, from Mother Nature. So it's a, you have to love being out there and, and having a lot of patience and, and sitting out there for hours and hours. But um, it to me, it's just a very natural progression of things that you you enjoy, love doing, just like yourself. You have many different from music to gaming to movies. You have different interests, and it yeah, has yeah. Led, led you to sit behind the microphone as you're doing right now. So it's yeah. Look, like, I I get a chance to learn from people like yourself, and it just enhances everything. And I get a chance to show my audience and try to turn them on to those ideas. You know, like. One thing that I want to get out, and, and so I don't forget, because I've personally struggled with this, and this is something that I want my audience to have the opportunity to, to get, is do you have um, a book that actually goes through your life, like a like a biography style book? Because I, actually, I haven't been able to no. find it. No, you, you haven't. I, I've been working on that book for, uh, you know, 40 years. <laughs> it, oh, okay, okay, because like... Yeah. Like, you know, you get referred to as an author and I know you've done the book about the Blackbird and, and, and like, you know, which is a beautiful, you know, very expensive, rightly so compendium of the Blackbird. But I thought that there was an actual biography and I've been dying to get my hands on it. I've I done, uh, no, no, I've done four books and I have uh, yet to, there's a bit, there's a piece of me in each of those books that's biographical, but to the actual biography needs to be done. I, I'm something I'm working on right now. I'm kind of working on a bird, a bird book about hawks and harriers, but mm. um, all of it will eventually go into a, um, a biography that needs, needs to be done. Um, and, and that's something I would like to, to finish. Not because I think I was some great person or had some <laughs> great value to mankind. Um, but, uh, because I've seen through my talks how much uh, positive oh. uh, inspiration people are, are getting from it. And I, I think it, it is an interesting story at the very least. Uh, and it should be told in its entirety uh, to get the full impact so that you, when you only hear 45 minutes, 50 minutes at a, a, a luncheon, uh, it's, it's not really the depth that, that uh, you, you, you really uh, 
that would make a good a good story. One thousand percent. I'm working on that, and no, it, it, there's no book you can. Oh, okay, find. because I like I'm I'm looking. I'm asking my friend to look for it. I, like I had my assistant spend like three hours <laughs> looking for it. And I'm like, I can't find this book. Is it like? No, no. The ground story <laughs> is uh, in, the, in the making. <laughs> yeah. Um. One. One. Um. One one thing that I also it's so funny like you know we're we're cut from very similar cloths even though I think I grew up um, as a child of the '90s like you know like even though like I was a child in the '80s is when I became you know kind of um, you know kind of independent but the '90s is really where I was like a little bit older and I could do my own things um, but I um, I you know didn't have the same level of i guess challenges that your generation had so things were a little easier for my generation so it bred a slightly softer human being i guess is my point um but we have a lot of the same passions even though i use computers to kind of simulate them where you actually did the real things um and another thing that i do is nature documentaries um and you know my my kind of focus has been around herpetology and like the study of like reptiles, mostly snakes. Um, and I, I, I know that feeling that you're talking about when you're mentioning going into the woods on hikes to photograph birds or butterflies or whatnot. When I go out there to do it uh, for snakes and uh, you know, like I live in Miami, Florida right now and in the Everglades, we have a huge rampant issue with pythons. And when we go out there to look for these pythons to remove them from the Everglades, yeah. It's such an exhilaration to go out there, not only to do something good for the environment, but to also capture the beauty of all of this with a camera is is a very special thing. Well, that's why that's why I'm saying it was a natural progression to me. If you're doing something you love and you uh, you really want to capture it on film, if you have the ability to get a camera on it, it it, it just even if you don't know a thing about photography, and I I was a great example of that. Um, you, you begin every now and then you get a really good shot and you go, wow, that's, that's something I would never, ever be able to get again. And I'm in a position to get that. And how lucky uh, am I? Yeah. To have that? Your, your, your photographs of the blackbird, which is the ones that I'm the most familiar with are, are all kind of standard 35 millimeter, then um, some medium format stuff. Like you can see the evolution of you as a photographer. Yeah, I, we were back in the days of F3 Nikons of rolls of 36 Kodachrome. There was no magic uh, digital anything. There, there was no Photoshop. You, you just waited uh, two weeks to see your Kodachrome slides on the light table, and you, you just prayed you got the exposure right. And did you have you continued to use some of these old film formats, or have you fully graduated into digital? Well, by now we've all fully graduated because first of all, nobody, no one's processing the film anymore. Right, right. A couple. And secondly, I thought maybe you had a like like a dark room back there. Well, you know, we went through that phase where I was very slow to go to digital uh, in the '90s. I I dragged my feet because I thought, all right, let's just see, uh, you know, because for a while it wasn't better, but then there came a very distinctive uh, level of digital photography where you just had to admit. Well, wow, that's as good as any Kodachrome slide I've I've taken, and uh, you know, just the the way it's processed on Photoshop and everything, um, the human eye is isn't going to be able to see anything better if you if you try to. That's see true. It well, I have more lines of resolution or something. But Sometimes the print is, is really tremendous. Yeah. The print, um, the uh, because like um, I I went to art school and I also went to film school. That's you know my 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 major was film and cinematography at New York University. And, uh, you know, developing uh, the film was cool, but printing it was also really fun where you would get that emulsion paper and you would have those big print machines and yes. you would press the button, expose it for X amount of time and then bathe it. And, and that paper, what the result that you would get from the paper is something that's very difficult to produce with a printer. There's something oh, about... Yeah. Yeah, that it's like anything in in history. You know, you, sometimes you you miss the old old way of doing it. It's not the same. Sure. I had a guy that did my printing in our little dark room. I had a little photo studio for several years when I got out of the Air Force. We did people, portraits, kids, just and I it, it taught me a lot about lighting. 
and I, I bought all these uh, umbrella lightings. And so I, I learned a lot in the 90s about lighting and I've taken all that with me in my head when I'm out shooting birds now. I do not use any flash, any artificial light, but I'm intrinsically aware of where the light is, how it's how it's coming and where I need I want to stand. Doesn't mean the bird's going to cooperate and, and face that way, but I know that I'm going to be, if that happens, I will sure. be where I need to be. And I, I see so many people going out there, so many people, just if they get the bird in the lens, boom, it's a shot. And it, uh, the shadows on the face and the eyes and the the deep uh, uh, shadow just ruins the picture for me. And it's, it's a... Uh, it's not so much a, a technique or a great talent. It's more of an awareness, just being aware. Okay, where is the sun? Where are the shadows? Where mm -hmm. am I standing? And is that really a shot I want to show as, as my work where I've, I've uh, darkened the entire face of the bird? So I learned a lot in those studio days, and it was fun. We did uh, pretty girls and, and little kids and, and little league and... Uh, uh, just, a, a, you know, I even did weddings, which uh, <laughs> taught, will teach you a lot, not only about lighting, but human nature. <laughs> right. Well, the fastest man in the world photographed my wedding. That's like. Well, the I had some people <laughs> walk up to me at weddings. They aren't you. Aren't you that guy? But yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I was it was a passion and a, and a hobby and a profession and a way I was making a little bit of money. Uh, but mostly you never made a lot of money, but you you uh, learn so much about it, which I took to my nature photography. And then when I got into butterflies and wildflowers and uh, now that I'm into birds, they're, they're like the fighter pilots of the uh, natural world out there. And they, oh, and 1, 1, and to 1,000% to slightly seg between the photography and the, and the planes or the aviation. Did you ever fly the uh, F-16, uh, the, what, what was called the Falcon? I, that no, I, got the, I got to fly in the back seat with the Thunderbirds, uh, but I did, it wasn't a primary. Uh, because, uh, because you're primary, because you're from the Navy, right? You, you were a Navy no, man? No, I'm the Air Force. I'll, I'm Air Force. Oh, you're Air Force. You're Air Force. But the, the, the F-16 is an Air Force plane, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's. But you always you always flew the back, never the front. That one, well, that one you didn't teach. Well, as the as the photographer guy, you, now you're you're, tell, you're confusing two different things. When I was in the Air Force, I flew front seat and back seat as an instructor. But when I was the photographer with the Thunderbirds or Blue Angels, of course, I'm going to be in the back seat. Uh, right, sure. Yeah. And, and did you ever fly the front seat of the of the Hornet? Um, no, I was always in the back seat with the of the Hornet. Yeah. That's cool. So so when you graduated um, from the and you know not not to bring up a bad memory but you know your your original incident um i believe it's in cambodia um where where all that happened was it cambodia am i getting that correct well it was near the cambodian border but uh technically it was it was actually in thailand and that was an a4 uh it was like an a1 but it was an at28d you have to oh, look okay um, so then you graduated uh, from that, and after your incredible recovery, that, that that you know, I you know believe that sometimes you get a help from the powers above. I know it's you know touchy to talk about those things nowadays, but you know sometimes you have that strength, and it comes from somewhere. You know that inspires you to like keep moving on, and and after you sort of get back into the world. You started flying again, which you overcame all these incredible odds. And I highly encourage, we won't get into all the details now, but I highly encourage you guys to look up the life of Brian Schull. It's one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard about overcoming adversity. Um, and long story short is that you're able to once again fly, even though countless amounts of very intelligent people told you it would never happen again. Yeah, um, well, they did, sure. <laughs> and, and, you know... Go ahead, go ahead, sir. I was going to say, uh, you, they were blessed with medical knowledge and knew what they were talking <laughs> about. I was I was just going on a, a wing and a prayer, you know. And uh, uh, for those people that find it to be a, quote, touchy subject to talk about a higher force in the universe, I, I would say that they were out of touch. I uh, agree. But the very universe that they are a part of. Uh, it is not, about, it's not about religion or or what you believe, it's it's just about it. 
Yeah, yeah, and I believe that also, you know, we live in a great nation that preserves everybody's individual right to, to well, have those beliefs. But I, you know? but I'm always amazed at uh, people that uh, can can look at the Milky Way at night and on. We have this, we have this grandiose idea that that we as humans are in charge of things and we are in control of things and that we form the destiny of the universe and then we've gotten too big for our, our, our boots. And the fact is we totally do not. And uh, once you realize that uh, it, the world, the world is even a, a more amazing uh, place to discover and see. Yeah. It's like, you know, like I've had this conversation with some of my, you know, uh, uh, sort of followers that are, you know, younger folks and they're like, well, you know, we live in the future now, social media changed everything. And I'm like, well, let me tell you something. When I was growing up, there was a commercial airliner that could fly you from London to New York in three hours. That doesn't exist anymore. I you know? know. We're actually going backwards. Life isn't better just because we have more technology. You, you, you're just more controlled. Now you have less options. Now you have sure. more exposure when you don't even want it. So I don't, the people that say that are very narrow in their thinking because they only know what era they live in. You can only base it on your own uh, historical age that you lived in or when you, you, what education you had and what you're exposed to. And, and the problem today is people are, have their nose in a cell phone or an iPad so much that those aren't their thoughts. And they are, they are really just pawns for whoever else is, or whatever it is that they're watching. And all that can be good entertainment and that's all fine and well and good, but uh, where is the development of their own thinking in a rational way, other than just uh, regurgitating? You know what what uh, they read on Wikipedia, as we all know, it's <laughs> right, right. right, which is not even a verified source. That's a completely yeah, public source. It's not even. I mean, there's no responsibility to factual anything on Wikipedia. Well, that's what I mean, and, and so as long as people are enamored with this, look at me. Here's what I did today on Facebook. Um, where I just, I, I, I'm so glad I grew up in the fifties as a kid and had to learn how to cope, uh, solve problems, think, create, uh, get along, mesh, uh, all the things that, uh, stay with you for the rest of your life. You can't teach people those things. Uh, you can teach how to, how to turn your, your iPad on and off and you can teach your, uh, people computers and, but where's the where's the thought behind it? Where's the uh, creativity? You know, and it's just it's just sad. I, I see a lot of sheep walking around today regurgitating things. Where I go, do you even know what that means? What you just said. <laughs> right. um, I, my big my big problem with the world is that I think we have a, a virus that's far far more deadly than COVID, and it's mm. called ignorance. I, there's, I, no I totally agree. there's no pill uh, there's no pill for stupid and there's no cure for it and the the more we keep pumping out ignorance out of our school system which now does not teach history and geography and math and thing things literature that are of value to forming a human being's thought process the more i don't know why people are surprised that the world is the way it is today when this is what you get the imbeciles are, are running the, the program. Yeah. So you, you, but no one thinks they're imbeciles because they think they're the smart ones. But we right we because it's also we, wrong to question like somebody's um to I guess what I'm trying to say it's it's almost become wrong to say that you're you got the wrong answer. It's like well but there are right right wrong answer. But with there there are there is right and wrong and there's there's things that you did never learn in school <coughs> to apply to come to your conclusions. People who study, uh, I heard a great quote the other day. Uh, it said, uh, people who do not study any history live their life like a leaf who never knows it was part of a tree. Right, and right. That's, very, that's a very good point. We are producing uh, and graduating in today's world uh, the most technically savvy generations who are the biggest imbeciles uh, when it comes to being uh, thoughtful, creative. Right, right. That's a very uh, good point. Human beings, and I—that's scary to me because the people who control all those things, 
uh, have found it's very easy to control these people. Because and, because and, they have no context. That's a really interesting quote because right. maybe you know how to program in three different programming languages, even though most people don't, because I, I employ a lot of developers and those people actually, that requires real knowledge, right? Like the knowledge people speak of today is uploading dance videos to TikTok and, and you know, pictures to Instagram. Um, but yeah, like knowing, being a leaf without knowing you're part of a tree, it's like you have this amazing thing, but you have no context of how it got there. Um, well, when you turn the computer off, what are you? Who are right. you? And what is your contribution? And what do you know and feel? And, you know, we we are still the, the one creature on earth that doesn't know where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, even though we try to pretend like we do, sure. like we have all those answers. And it's okay to say, I, I, I don't know. And that's why life should be a, a journey of discovery. Uh, and I just think we're not giving the younger generation the tools to do that. We gave them, we gave them iPads and cell phones and Facebook and TikTok and more pornography than you could digest as a 17 year old in high school. Sure. Like, so and where's more, more computing computer? power than your plane had and you went 90,000 feet and went from here to Korea and, and probably I just think that that that, I just think that every ill that we talk about in our society today from you know gun control to abortion to uh, mass murders to uh, theft to to killings to just the idiocy of our society is all stems back to ignorance the racism mm -hmm bigotry of people it's ignorance it isn't it isn't some math formula it isn't some great uh, uh it's not that some demographic of, of people that uh have, have learned it's ignorance and if we could just go back to having an education system where there are standards but that right. seems uh, when people wanted to change all the standards and say well you can't make my kid do pe because He's a little overweight. Well, your kid's the one that needs the people. <laughs> so we, once we went down that slippery slope, I saw it happening, and I thought, "Wow, look at the look at the tripe that's on TV that people are watching and filling their heads with from a young age." Now they're filling their heads with the uh, Game Boys and little uh, iPads and uh, little kids in school. And so when they grow, when they're twenty five. What do they really know, and what sure. what direction are they uh, going? So, it's not about someone's right or someone's wrong, or my beliefs are better. Than, it's just plain ignorance. Right. And so, so you're saying, you know, you you mentioned that you don't think that there's a a known cure for ignorance, but it sounds like you're saying that a very kind of thorough, standardized education system could be that cure well how about an education system that's that has standards that and how about it teaches things that are uh, universally you know accepted as knowledge and and sure. and give a give you don't have to sway people on which way to believe they can still think the south was right in the civil war that's fine but at least study the civil war at least read some books about it instead of that one paragraph in Wikipedia and saying, yeah, I know what, I know all about the Civil War now. Right, right. People, yeah, people claim they have knowledge that they really don't. They have the headline that they've kind of heard and they've contextualized yeah. it based on a kind of groupthink mentality. Well, it's a, right? there's, no pill, there's no pill for stupid. And people don't <laughs> even know. It. It's like, it, what was it, Stephen Hawking said, it, it, ignorance is not the problem. It's the illusion of knowledge. Right. And you have a lot of people running programs today and governments and, and companies that have the illusion of, of knowledge and power. Uh, so it's... It's kind of, I guess we got a little off topic here, but I. Oh, no, no, no. This is fascinating because. Well, as like, you get older, as you get older, you just see these things so clearly and you just shake your head and say, you know what, you're not going to fix that overnight because look what you're producing out of schools. They can't write a sentence. They can't yeah. have an original thought. There's no ability to go to a library and research anything. Um, right. Right. Don't yeah, yeah, to, libraries don't even exist anymore. But that's yeah. what I mean. We closed the libraries. No one knows how to read books or study or or compare comparative thinking. So it's 
it's just sad. I'm just so glad. I, I grew up in the 50s and 60s as a kid, and people say, well, you had many, many problems. In, in those days, you had all these ills in society. Yeah, yeah. Every every society age can say that, of course. So my it only strengthens my whole point that you need educated people to deal with these things, to solve mm -hmm. these problems, to, to attack them in a way that's, that's – um, healthy and good and positive it's not about <laughs> one group gaining control because there's so many dummies out there they can control them <laughs> one thousand percent and i also think that like we're almost kind of reverting back to the times of galileo where they you know because galileo questioned the sort of operating norms about what the catholic church at the time believed about our position in the universe they threw the smartest man on the planet in a yeah. Like like in a cave and like at least they didn't kill him, you know. Right, right. At least they didn't kill him. They threw him in a cave and said, Yeah, keep your thoughts in inside the cave. Um and, and it feels like we're going through that now because you know, to kind of bring this back to media a little bit, I'm a huge fan of movies, obviously. It's been my career, it, you know, it was my education like growing up and going to NYU. And Jurassic Park for me was such a, a kind of a breakthrough moment in my childhood because it, it, it kind of taught me, you know, it taught the world really that, you know, dinosaurs were, you know, came from birds and that everything you think, you know, you got a question because science is the, is, is an evolutionary thing. It changes based on new data. It's constantly evolving. And that's what science is, right? It's just an ability to take data. Yeah, that's called learning. You would have to learn and read and study. Oh my yeah. God. You're, you're asking people to do the impossible now. How dare you? I, I want to just go see the movie and form my own opinion. You know? Right. And now in the new Jurassic Park, and this is my point, because the old Jurassic Park had the right ideas. Yeah. Science is an evolving concept. The new Jurassic Park literally says science is the ultimate truth. It's like, no, it's not. No, it's, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> uh, science is the first people to admit they, that they don't know and that they're trying to find a theory that that is it evolves and changes all the time. Yeah, That's which is amazing I, I, that like this this yeah. this this propaganda against science is being held up yeah. with the badge of being scientific. It, it, I always love the people who who hate uh, Charles Darwin and, and and spew all this. And I go, have you ever read any of his works? Have you ever understood? It? Of course not. No, no. Right. They just they just think what they're what they're going to think and. Uh, that's just sad. So I, I, I'm sadder about the world today because of the, the disease of ignorance than I am. COVID will come and go. And yeah, yeah, COVID will I come mean, and go. It sucks, and I don't recommend it. If you haven't gotten it, uh, sir, I, I recommend you, you know, try to avoid it at all costs because it, it was nasty. Have you gotten it yet? Have you been through well, it? No, I got okay, the good. shots. And, uh, I didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the shots too. So, so to bring it back um, to. Okay to aviation for one second, because there's an experience that I would love to hear a firsthand account of um, that sounds to me like the ultimate kind of learning that you can impart to somebody of focus in a tight situation. And this is the concept of air to air refueling. And um, you, you mentioned this a little bit in your talks, how this is one of the most um, harrowing experiences out there. And for folks that don't know, um, these incredibly powerful fighter jets, um, you know, burn through fuel like crazy. They kill dinosaurs like, you know, one, you know, five dinosaurs a second. Uh, <laughs> and um, you, uh, a lot of times you have to refuel midair. And so you have to like at 300 miles an hour or whatever it is, you have to take this little tiny pipe and put it inside your plane and refuel and go. Um, you've, this, even in the simulators that I play, I still can't do it. Like I have a few study level simulators and I've never been able to successfully do it. Uh, like, what is that like in real life when you're like in the world's fastest airplane with 
with like a timer going off saying, hey, if you don't feel up, you're going to die. So it's like... Uh, well, that's very true. You're very motivated. There's a lot of adrenaline when you realize you're going into the North Sea if you don't uh, get that gas. There's no place, there's no other uh, rest stop out there. <laughs> right. So you get very uh, focused, very concentrated, very... Uh, and as, as many, many um, times in flying uh, high-performance military jets, many times this happens to you, with landing, night landings, uh, night refuelings, formation, flying. Um, so there's times when you have such an adrenaline uh, focus that you just have to do it. Now, you're, you're terrified. You don't think you can do it. You're you're scared. You, you're you uh, feeling uh, anxious, but you just, behind all of that is the big, you must do it sign. So you just do it. And um, you look back later and go, I don't know how I, I don't know how I got through that or did it that night. Were, were there tricks that you would do? Like think of something? Like did you like? Was there something in your cockpit that you would well, use as a point yeah. of reference or like yeah, any kind of yeah. mental trick? Yeah. Well, you, you have references to get into position. You'd have the the inner engines of the uh, the nacelle nacelles of the uh, KC one thirty five. You'd put them on the the windows. Uh, sill there and you had little thing i i always went back to my instructor and in pilot training the first time i uh he showed us formation you know the first time you put two jets close together and yeah that's your first big oh my god moment uh right where it you know right then who the fighter pilots are and who the, the guys that go wow this is the coolest thing i want to learn how to do this and the other guys go like i don't i don't ever want to fly that close to a jet <laughs> Right, right. Well, I, I loved it, but it was terrifying to see, you know, the rivets on the wing next to you. And my instructor said, okay, look, see, we're, we're doing it. He said, when you get really tense, you, you're getting so tense, you know, you're squeezing the stick or the throttle's too hard. Your whole body is tensing up, which is bad. He mm. said, just wiggle your toes in your boots. Just, just wiggle your toes and think about that. And, you know, as silly as that sounds, the fact that you just take a second to think about that and do it, actually does relax the your your forearm and your shoulder and your right squeezing of fingers on the on the throttles because it's a um well every feeling is is nothing more than a formation maneuver um and when That's it goes smooth, when it goes smoothly you know it's all really you go wow this is easy i'm i'm really good you think wow i'm golden hands today and then when it does there's a little turbulence or things aren't going real well you you cannot you, you, you think, how did I even get my wings? I can't even do this. So, um, and, and you talk to Navy guys landing on carriers. It's the same thing. They Some days it's just, boom, it worked perfect. And there's other times when you, you don't even think you can get the airplane down. But, again, you know you have to, and you do it. And that's what makes fighter pilots. It isn't about we're the greatest, we're the best, whoever was with it. No, it's just the attitude of mm. go do this. Uh, and it's that old uh, saying that um, – about crossing the threshold you there comes a point when you get to the edge and you have to cross that threshold and you can't go back and you get there is no other way and you're terrified you think oh, well i could just i could die with this next step you go yep you signed on for that that's why you're a fighter pilot and then well, you just crossing the threshold that that's that yeah, sounds very great like when you have to do it you'd be amazed what you can do um and it's why a lot of fighter pilots like myself now people say, don't you miss the flying? Don't you? You know, no, because I did it all. I did it for 20 years and I had more moments of sheer terror than you, I could possibly <laughs> convey. Um, and I had such moments of joy that made me want to keep doing it. But, but uh, it's okay to walk away from it while you still can. Do, um, do you have a little Cessna or, or a plane that you still fly to? This day, no, not at all. I, I did my last flying after my Blue Angel uh, year. Uh, did some Air National Guard stuff around 96, 97. I hung up my spurs. I said, I'm not going to do any more flying because if I owned a little Cessna, you'd have to stay current and be safe. And I wouldn't fly it enough. And then I, who could afford it anyway? Right, 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 right. The gas, so especially it, the gas. What was the, what was the fun of doing that? I didn't, I had to have a reason. And I thought I'd rather put my money into my camera gear at that point. Sure. So sure. Thought, you have the memory and like, it's yes, all, it's all there. You have the memory of it. And now every time I watch a Hawk or a Harrier zip across that field and do that 90 degree right turn and grab that mouse. And I, I, 
relive every fighter pilot moment of a very old uh, majesty that I'd ever felt or done. I said, you know, I can kind of relate to that bird, but not not the way they do it. Boy, it's uh, they can change the shape of their wing. <laughs> That's not right, bad. right, right. Kind of like a little bit like the tomcat, right? Like uh, like it's got the ability to kind of go a little bit more delta. Well, but more than that, they can just actually change the camber of the whole lift coefficient, and they could just right, right. and like turn. one they to could the bring left. One, they could bring yeah. one wing in and hold one wing out and make a turn that will water your eyes. It, it right, right. That's turn. awesome. So, yeah. so like your you flew the most advanced version that humanity has ever done in terms of machinery, and your evolution as a human, which is so fascinating, is actually to admire where that how that evolved in a biological life form in the bird so well, you like, know what's funny is that people when people ask me I, I and i've had a lot of years to think about these things as time has gone on i look at uh i have a little personal relationship with the the plane in that we we both ha have something in common and, and of course the plane becomes a living entity to you when you when you fly it it's it's, it's an actual entity Sure, it's good. That airplane should have never been built. I should have never been able to pass a physical after my hospital thing. That airplane, they said, you can't do it. You can't build a plane out of titanium. No one's ever done it. It won't work. Here's why. And they were right. And Kelly Johnson said, well, we're just going to have to figure out a way and do it. And my doctors all said, you know, you'd be lucky to be alive. You're never going to fly again. So get that through your head. I'll just be and, and uh, there was one doctor there that said, well, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to try and right. let's see how far you can go with your therapy and, and we'll keep operating on you. The point is, I, I relate to the whole, uh, it can't be done to let's find a way. And even if you fail, at least you, you failed greatly. And I was, I thought I have nothing to lose uh, to try. And Kelly Johnson and, and his crew had to invent technology to build that airplane they had to just come up with there was no way it was going to work at those speeds and altitudes and why do you think it has never been duplicated to this day why do you think it still holds every speed and altitude record because they invented technology that did not exist and worked sure. with the titanium and everything so that that miracle of the creation of a jet that probably shouldn't have even existed uh, is the same miracle of luck, I feel, uh, that the guy who was the least likely guy on the planet to fly this jet uh, ends up being the one person who's kept the memory of the jet alive for all these years uh, later in... in uh, and, and, and like the biggest kind of poetic irony of all of this, or poetic, uh, maybe irony is. not the word, just sort of poetic notion, is that this plane didn't have any weapons, uh, had no had no bombs, had no missiles, had no guns, but it had speed and it had a camera and it had maybe the most sophisticated camera that's ever been known, right? Like in terms of telephoto lensing. Well, get, keep in mind, the airplane was a 57 Chevy. It was pretty, pretty basic <laughs> technology, right. but, but the sensors each decade, they put new uh, high resolution sensors on the airplane and not weren't just cameras. They had different uh, laser infrared uh, look through weather look underwater listening devices think they did and most of them they didn't brief us on too much they figure you don't need to know you just fly the black line come back and, and we'll download it you don't need to know if you're ever captured we don't even want you to know all that stuff and, and like uh, do you mean that quite literally like did you have a display on your plane that literally had a line that that you flew no the black line of the map uh, that said here's your route we call right, that right. But like you had no display of a map in your in your console, right? Well, we did, but it wasn't, we did have a display of a map, but it wasn't all the, at that altitude and speed. Uh, I was just a wild reference. It didn't help. <laughs> right, right. That man in the back seat was your your main uh, navigator. Right, he had right. right. Astro inertial nav system back there that was pretty pretty impressive for its day. So. So look, we're we're running, um, you know, we're we're approaching an hour, and I want to be very respectful of your time. You've been so gracious with it. There's one question I have to ask you. Well, no, actually, I I don't mind. I've done a million of these Zoom conferences over the COVID years. This one has been actually more fun because you didn't ask all the standard stupid questions I get all the time. Well, how fast did it really go? 
and we got to talk about a variety of different things. Uh, oh, cool. well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, so, I, uh, people always want to talk about, and I don't mind that. But yeah, yeah, and like, look, I, I kind of know those things because I'm a huge aviation nut, and like, you know, I'm. I'm well, very no, let's not, let's not pat you on the back too much. You thought I was in the navy. <laughs> let's 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 give you a big black mark on that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry about that navy comment. That that. <laughs> Because like you had mentioned that you taught a Top Gun, and like because of the movie, I'm convinced it's a Navy thing. Well, no, the Air Force has its own uh, weapons school and fighter leading school, and all that's similar, but it's it's a different thing. But uh, but uh, they have their own, and it's a great school. And I I guess that's one of the heartburns people have with the movies that those guys are so professional and so sure. they work so hard, and it's uh, such a very dangerous and difficult thing that they do and it's it's just when you when you watch the dialogue and the cartoon like figures in the movie you just go you just go dear god you know? yes so so you have to watch it without the you know turn the volume off <laughs> but just admire because it really is a breakthrough in cinematography no it, it looked like it was yeah yeah it's so, so okay so here's my question because okay. one of my kind of you know when i was growing up um you know, I grew up, like I said, I was a child of the 80s and, and then the 90s. But in the 80s, as Americans, you know, whatever your political things are, let's keep that to the side. Who cares? We had a president at the time who was the epitome of presidential. You know, yep. when you think about that word presidential, yep. you know, you can't beat the notion and the and the stereotype and the archetype, I should say, yep. of Ronald Reagan, you know, yep. and. In some of your speeches, I've heard you mention Ronald Reagan, and it, it almost sounded like you had met him. Had, did you actually meet him? Well, you know, we did not. We almost got to. Uh, Walter and I were going to get a, an a award for our uh, work during the Libya crisis, and they told us that the president was going to issue a presidential uh, accommodation or something, and we might get to go to the White House. That was the rumor. That never materialized at all because he he wanted to downplay. He didn't want to make it more of a political, uh, give him more fodder, you know, against us. So we just were so proud to serve under a commander in chief that had a spine and a backbone and took action. A man who wasn't afraid of what everybody would say. A man who stood up for what he believed in and uh, and uh, did it even in the face of such criticism and and in the long run history has proven him right and uh, to be a, a i think a, a very good president now you know history books change and everyone has their opinion and it's it's really not about politics as much as hey you're the man in charge right now this is what's happening in the world and he said enough and he took action and i have not seen that uh, in the last 20, 30 years at all. Yeah, yeah. Damn, I got a little emotional there. Um, yeah, there was something about him that was very special and made you very proud to be an American. And I think created a very America first sentimentality across the whole country, right? There was like like a proudfulness about America when he was around, like, you know, we had the Olympics in Los Angeles in 84. Well, he was very presidential, as you said, and him and Nancy yeah. had the greatest, uh, uh, hosted the greatest events at the White House, and it was, it meant something. There was a pride in, in your country and in your president and in the way that it was it was handled with dignity and class. You know, and, they're, they're, uh, and force when they, necessary. And you know what? Uh, sorry for all the doves out there, but the world's a bad place. There's a lot of bad people who, who want to kill you and you better have somebody who uh, all you have to do is look no further than how we just pulled out of Afghanistan to make you want to just throw up. I know, but, I know. I've been hearing stories about that and I must admit that I am ignorant to the reality of what's going on there, but the stories around the Afghanistan stuff sounded horrific. Well, when you have, when you have a, a society now that has permeated into the military and we're more concerned about soothing everyone's feelings in the military than we are about being combat ready, you have a problem. And you can say you don't. You can say, well, let's just all get along and we'll all be friends. And uh, these are the same kind of people who were living in Nazi Germany in the 30s that said, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll all just be fine. And the Brits said the Germans would never do that again you know, after World War One. And again, we go back to people who don't study history and understand what goes on in the world. And uh, 
they just blindly think, well, my little world here in the, you know, downtown Main Street in USA is good. So I guess the rest of the world's okay. One, uh, one, one anecdote that I have to bring up because I will literally listen to it like, you know, sometimes randomly and you just uh, have to bring it up. I know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's the um, it's the stuff about Korea um, that yeah. Re that Reagan, uh, you know, wanted you guys to go do a quick little mission. And the way you tell the story, it's so good. Like, I highly recommend you guys go check out Brian Scholl's videos there. He's you're such a good speaker and you create the sense of humor throughout the entire experience, which is well, I think that's important. Yeah. Yes. Because it's very serious subject matter. But you're you know, you you create some great lines, like lines that I've even tried to incorporate in my own life. Like you, you can convince uh, someone from the army to do anything or, you know, there's some great <laughs> lines that you have, but the, the, the story about you going to Korea and doing the figure eights, like around a conference that was going on, um, you know, to fax them photographs, to let them know like, hey, we're looking at you, so don't get too cute. Well, like, and to mostly give them that double sonic boom too, right to, right in the middle of their uh, conference. That was Reagan's way of saying, yeah, we know, we know what you Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Just like, like so so the people that haven't listened to your stuff can understand like what that well, means. Well, the communists were having a big, a big conference there in North Korea, they, and they invited all the bad guys there, the Russians, <laughs> the, Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Koreans. They didn't invite us. And Reagan knew well what was going on, you know, and it was just his way. Reagan was uh, a real needler. You know, he used to, like, stick a little jab. He liked to jab you a little bit, even with all of his salt talks with the Soviets and all of his uh, meetings with the, the, the uh, Russians. He did just jab you a little bit to let you know, yeah, I'm the wild cowboy, and you better watch out because I'll send the Enterprise right into your harbor, and you can't do anything about it. Um, <coughs> that, there was this conference going on, and uh, our commander in Okinawa that day told us, said, yeah, we're just, you guys are just going to make two or three passes over this uh, one area, and, and it's going to be unlike your normal mission. And here we, uh, what I remember most about it was as we came back through the other way heading east that we had to reposition to come back all out into the almost Yokohama out in the in the Sea of Japan, which had, it was a really incredible sight. I'd never flown quite out that far, uh, so we're we're repositioning to to turn around at that speed to come back over and drag that double sonic boom. And, and they just so they'd know, and and that airplane had a distinctive sonic boom. Right. It's just Reagan's way of saying, yeah, you can do what you want. But uh, we still got the big stick. <laughs> right. Once you lose that, you know, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm just saddened what I see happening today. Uh, I don't even get me started on that. I, I, I try to divorce myself from politics and, and all that's going on in the military. I just go out in, in nature because it just makes you sad uh, to see it. The greatest country in the world. Um, it just didn't, it doesn't have to be like this. You know, just, yeah, uh, it's. Look, yeah, too many good people, dedicated people that were let down and uh, weren't listened to. And uh, Yeah, the, the, there's, some, there's some heartbreaking stories. I don't know if you ever watched the Joe Rogan show, but he had um, yeah. a, a private citizen who, who was former Navy, I believe. Maybe I'm, I hope I'm not getting that wrong, but his name is Tim Kennedy. He was also like a UFC fighter. And um, he went over there as a private citizen to try to get people out. Um, and he rescued thousands of people uh, from there. But he saw, he literally was seeing people throwing babies over barbed wire fences, um, you know, during the pullout of Afghanistan. And some babies didn't make it over the fence and would get completely slashed up and would end up, you know, dead on the floor. You know, it's just like some horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. And then like when we, when the media paints it here, there's no room to question yeah. it or, or 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 to see what's going on it's like no it's fine and if you question it then you're a, a you know a bad well, person we're more concerned about which bathroom we're supposed to use so we can't be concerned about things like that going on yeah yeah no it's um yeah it's yeah it, it, it's, to what i said uh, mark it's ignorance it's not it's right. not politics it's not about the money it's not about the, it's that uh, people just don't and the ones that know better 
for them, it is about the politics and the money. They know better, and they they know that they can control. Right, their- right. Because politics means power, and it's a way to make it easier for them to maintain their power. It's the oldest story in the playbook. You it know? is. It's, it is. You know, it's the Roman Empire all over again. So. Yeah, there, there's um, there's a there's a um, there's a great Ronald Reagan quote. Oh God, I hope I don't butcher it, but like that the that. Uh, can I believe he says that the eight scariest words in the human language is I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, um, yeah, there, there's, there's some, yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, you're so right. You know, there it's, if we can solve that ignorance issue, so many things would at least start to develop. Like there's another great quote that one of my best friends kind of, you know, turned me on to, which is this idea that, you know, um, propaganda starts when the dialogue ends and Mm -hmm. there's no dialogue, you know, and you're not allowed to have dialogue, you know? You would have more meaningful dialogue if people had really come to the table uh, learned and studied. Right, right, right. Think how many young people, think how many young people in the world who has as their only source of all the World War II history they will ever know just by watching Saving Private Ryan. That is the only moment mm, in their life where they have an point. inkling of one. That is their whole World War II history right there. Right, right. And that, that war and those five years in history, there's so much to learn and study and that has affected our world today. And that is this, this whole Ukraine thing. This is just right out of the playbook of, of 1939 uh, Germany. That people, that's just sad to me. There were so many great books written, so much research done, so many, Eisenhower himself said, we must preserve these pictures and these films so that this never happens again. We should force people to learn this and see it and do it so that it, they never will repeat it. And and people are, even want to deny that those things happen. They don't know, ah, that's all ancient history. We don't care about that. Did you know they're just not even teaching those things anymore? And you go, wow, what are you teaching? And then when you see what they are teaching, all you can do is just hang your head. And, and yeah, it seems like a lot of what they are teaching is just show, is just trying to teach young <laughs> well, people that we live in a bad place and that this is a, yeah. a, a horrible country. And you're only you know? okay if you, you do it my way. <laughs> That's sad. I, right, right. And you know, vote for I, me I because if not, we'll show. find you. I don't want to bring the show down with it. You know, we're not going to solve uh, the world's problems. And then we, we don't have all the answers. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. You're, you know, look, you're absolutely right. But one answer that we do have um, is that there's a lot of but beauty. A good sonic boom in your face would be okay. I'm sorry? <laughs> but a good sonic boom on the back of their head would be okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think, <laughs> let me ask you just a random question just to kind of lighten it up like, like, like for a second. Do you think if they put you in the cockpit of an SR-71 right now. You can turn her on, get her flying, and take her up? No. <laughs> no. Like, I'd, like, like, I'd like to say, yeah. You know, everybody, you know, would, a lot of guys, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. No. You, you went through a year of training to get comfortable with the airplane. Yeah. Um, I would. It would look familiar, of course, and you'd remember stuff, and you'd go, oh, yeah. This, but it was a very uh, checklist-oriented crew Two men uh, got it down to, to a, a science where you, you work with the same guy every day. Um, that is not something you just jump back in like a joy. And, you know, guess what? They're not calling back a 60-year-old guys like Tom Cruise to come back and fly the airplane. <laughs> he was really good. You know? <laughs> tell, me, tell me a little bit about Walter. Um, you know, like uh, you guys seem like, sure. you know, you shared a, a kind of a human bond Yes, that yeah. very few people will ever experience. Like, what what was that like? How, you're, like very, you're, you're, very, and... you're very correct, and thank you for asking about Walter. I love talking about my man in the back. He he was just one of the greatest guys. Uh, Walter and I are best friends to this day. We flew together for four years. He was a brilliant engineer. We were just polar opposites as personalities. And Walter was very quiet, very reserved, very. As an engineer, you know, very thoughtful. And then I, I was more um, 
it was like uh, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson in those uh, movies. <laughs> hey, you know, you kind of remind me of that, you know. Uh, but he was, he's a brilliant guy. And um, when I was inducted into the Air Force Legends Hall of Fame, uh, he came uh, to support me there. It was a great thing. And then six years later, Walter was inducted into the Air Force Legends Hall of Fame for all the work that he did, not just with our SR days, but in, but in the Air Force, helping uh, minorities get through ROTC programs, get through pilot training. There were so few black officer fighter pilots in his day. He was such an exception, the only black guy ever to be in this program. Wow. Uh, so we're the only crew in history now of this jet that both guys are in the Air Force Legends Hall of Fame. We're kind of proud of that. Uh, oh, but there, there's an actual Air Force Hall of Fame. It's uh, the Legends Hall of Fame. Yeah, they do this Ring of Fire uh, celebration every year uh, at the Air War College, and uh, it's really. Oh, I didn't know that. That sounds really it's fascinating. Quite a cool thing. Uh, but we we talk uh, all the time. We email, and in fact, I'm going to be getting hold of him. I'll be talking to him today about this uh, simulator SR thing because we all have to get together and go over the checklist. They want to record our our voices and everything it's gonna oh, be that's so awesome do, yeah. do you know who's making it because i you I, know that's my I business i have an entire some, studio that does that some company in canada that it's a very small company but boy they I, I forget the name i just know the guy's name but they are good they the stuff they've done is looks like the real jet to me but anyway walter's in south carolina now he, he retired from teaching school helped a lot of the young underprivileged kids there uh, that's awesome. Sorry, just a tremendous individual. Been married to the same woman for 50. I went to his 50th anniversary. And uh, he lives so darn far away, though, that it's hard. Uh, once or twice a year, we get together and we do a presentation together. Oh, I'd love yeah, to see that. That's really fun. And, and we usually do a big fundraiser and, and uh, some big group. We get like a thousand seat theater. And we've always sold out. It's always been a sellout. The last one we did was in Las Vegas where we had... Uh, almost 2,000 people there. It was a, a air traffic controllers conference. And uh, about a third of the way through my talk, I said, you know, right about here, I make a lot of jokes about my backseat and all. I said, but you know what? We have a special, uh, you know, event for you today. And he comes out. That's awesome. And uh, they just love Walter because now he's going to tell all the stories on Brian Schul that, uh, that yeah. uh, make um, them. That you guys also do a lot of work with the Wounded Warriors Project, right? Well, I'm an official uh, wounded wounded warriors uh, uh, an official uh, donor. Uh, so we uh, uh, throughout the year we make contributions and uh, we do a portion of uh, all our proceeds uh, goes to that. Just they're the best group out there for what they do uh, after the the uh, patient leaves the hospital and how they're helping with mental health health issues and they, they do so much good that uh, we're happy to uh, support yeah. them. Walter and supports some other groups too. Yeah. Were, were the Wounded Warriors a group when you were yeah. hospitalized? No, right? This came much later. Yeah, yeah. And it's a very valuable, it filled the void. Yeah, and they do a lot of good. Uh, they really do. So uh, Walt and I live on the, both ends of the country. Uh, it's fun when we get together. Uh, we don't have one scheduled yet for this year. I, we almost had one in November. We, that may still happen here in California where he'll fly out and uh, come out on stage. And uh, it, he's, he's great. He's the, uh, we're just the antithesis of each other, but That's he's awesome. a brilliant guy. And uh, I had the best backseater I could have had. Uh, he really uh, knew what he was doing back there. And uh, the, the reason we were so successful as a crew is, is I always tell this little story, is that one day we came in for our simulator training during that year of training. And the instructor was sick that day. They said, hey, you get a free period. Just kind of go over your own procedures. Uh, there's no instruction today. So Walt and I had this great idea that we were having a little problem with communicating, which is very common in the early stages of this training. And we just weren't understanding. Why aren't you listening to what I'm saying? I've got a firelight. I want you to do this and that. And he's going like, you're, you don't understand. You know? So we had this brilliant idea. We had this whole free period, two hours. He said, come here. I want to sit you in the back seat. I'm going to put you in my seat. I said, okay, what, how hard can that be? You don't have a stick. You're not even flying the jet. What <laughs> so he put me in his seat in the back. There are two separate simulators for this uh, airplane. 
And I got back there and I got, oh my God, how do you read all this stuff? Look at me. He says, Brian, I got my head down. I'm looking down here at the console. And then you're asking me to do this is I don't even have half the gauges that you have. So when you say this, it means nothing to me because I have nothing that says that. Right, right. Back to your ignorance. It's a yes. similar concept. So we did that for an hour and I was, I was humbled. I thought, man, well, you are Albert Einstein back here. <laughs> right. Okay. You come with me to the front seat because I want to show you all the stuff that's lighting up up there that that I'm, I'm scrambling to I need your help. So he sat in there. We got, I said, put, you know, fly it. I'm going to put you up at altitude. You put your hand on the stick and throttles. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flash that red firelight. And I will show you what happens. So he did that. Okay. Long story short, when we were done, I thought Walter was a genius. And mm. I would never raise my voice again to him. And he thought I was a sky god. <laughs> I will never bother Brian when he's in the middle right, of life. Right. What it did, what it did, it gave us such perspective mm. that we had we used to we, we became a well oiled crew then because we knew we knew what things to say, what not to say. First of all, that's a beautiful, yeah, that's a beautiful analogy. Um, because it's so true. Oh yeah. Brian, you you all you give me way too much to think about. It's well, such a Better to have a thoughtful, provoking show than one of those boring Zoom Zoom things where everyone goes, hey, how fast did the jet go? Really? <laughs> right, well, right. I heard a Not story. Not three plus for the record. Yeah, that's the right. Yeah. That's right. I heard a story once. So it was that you. Yeah. Wow. So so basically, it's like, you know, it's like that old saying of walking another uh, person's shoes to really yeah. know what they're going through. But like, it's like it's almost like every debate should have a primer prior to the debate of the other person experiencing the other person's reality without bias, right? Like, like it, it's such a, a critical component, you know, to try to relate to one another. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's powerful stuff, man, because it's, it's, um, it's a lost art form, right? It's like, if you're slightly different than me, I don't know where that happened not to get all serious again, but when you're slightly different than somebody, you've automatically become an enemy. It's like, when did that happen? You know, we and used to celebrate our- uh, It happened when cavemen uh, moved across the plains and uh, found a different tribe and- <laughs> Right, right. fair, touche, touche, fair, fair point. It's, it's a human instinct to- Sure. Your own, uh, that isn't some, yeah, I have a degree in history and anthropology and I, I, man hasn't changed all that much. We've just dressed up the surroundings a lot since. Right, then. right. We're, we're still just as idiotically um, private and uh, protective and territorial. We're mammals, and uh, that's what we do. And uh, that's why we have to we have to become civilized to, to the uh, extent that we don't just destroy each other. You know? and, and and what what kind of you know sort of takeaways do you think? A, a younger demographic should should take, you know? Like if you were to leave my audience with one little message of, you know, to, you know, um, of wisdom, well, kind of like what, like what, what's, what's, what's the, what's the, what's the, the lesson, so to speak? Well, I'd say get your face out of the cell phone. Life's happening out there and you're missing it. Um, you think life is happening in your devices and that's just a replica of someone else's life. Uh, your life's happening out there. It's not a dress rehearsal. This is your one life and time on the planet. And it goes by really fast. And all the anxiety that you're, you're getting out of what you're, you're seeing in there and all of the uh, low self-esteem and all the, you don't like your life, change it. Do it. Quit asking for the miracles and be the miracle. You know, quit, quit expecting it to be handed to you and just go out and do your life. Mark Twain once said the two greatest days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Mm. And I would venture to say you're not finding out poop with your face in that device. Get out there and, and then once you find out why, go out and, and do it on purpose every day. And, and for you, just like you're one of the few humans that that have, have ever seen two sunsets in one day, you're also one of the few humans to be born twice, right? Like uh, to be legitimately. I feel like there was. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like I, I got a do-over. So I'm very, 
aware and appreciative. I have a perspective about not taking it for granted every day, every minute of every day. And when do you young, actually know your second birthday? Like, do you yeah. remember what the second birthday is? April, April 11th. It's, it's, I'm 48 now in my second life. Yeah. Oh, wow. We're almost the same age. You're, you're an Aries. Yeah. You're an Aries. That's, in your why, second that's why I can relate to you. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you're 48 in your second life. That's, yeah. that's amazing. I just think life, life is what you make it. I'm, I'm so tired of everybody thinking, uh, well, if I make a lot of money, I'll be successful, then I'll be happy. It doesn't, that equation doesn't work. Why don't you just be happy and the money will follow you and do things that you enjoy, that you have an enthusiasm for that is positive. You know, there's negative energy and there's positive energy. The universe was formed with positive energy of, of recreating stars and cells multiplying. And so when you, when you induce negative energy into your life, it's, it's going nowhere. Um, yeah. I will just leave you with this one last thought, which I, I say in my talk sometimes. Yes, yes, please. You can go, you can go for uh, weeks without food. You can go days without water. You can even last a few minutes with no oxygen to your brain. But the minute that you lose hope, you're done. And mm. I see more people with their face in their cell phones and iPads who don't look real happy than I do people that are gaining great joy out of whatever it is that they're uh, looking at that day. And I think living in fear and anxiety and depression like that, uh, life's happening while you're, you're, you're doing all that stuff. So. It's powerful stuff. Well, he's yeah. Major Brian Schull. Um, I'm going to put all the links to all of your books. I know that your books are primarily co collector's items. So th these are not... Oh, we yeah, they're, we sell them. They're, they're like $300 on the average. Yeah, because they're big, you know, they're beautiful, hard, like hard by Yeah, yeah, the coffee table book. Sleddriver.com. Don't, Sled don't go to gallery Don't go to gallery1.com. Go to sleddriver.com. Sleddriver.com. Sleddriver is also the name of the, that's what you guys used to call you or the plane? Oh, the was plane was the, the, the sled. We called it the sled sometimes. It was the habu, it's the blackbird, but sometimes we call it the sled. Because of, because of Santa Claus? Was that the reason? No, well, just uh, someone said that one day he was taking a tour that when it was taking the runway, it looked like one of those double A fuel dragsters, the, the long rails taking the runway there, the way it, it was that long, long uh, fuselage. And they just used that term, and it, I just thought that was the coolest thing. All right, so, so once. One stupid question to leave the show. Um, well, and you've already asked at least. <laughs> <laughs> All right. no, I'm just kidding. The Blackbird, Los Angeles to New York. How fast could it do it? 68 minutes uh, was what it did, but uh, it could go a little faster. Yeah. You're doing a mile, cool. every, a mile every two seconds, but it'll do a mile every second and a half if you wanted to. Yeah, and this is just, just put that into perspective, guys. This is something that was built in 1965, I believe. Well, 62, basically. 62, yeah. wow. 66, the Air Force started flying missions out of Beale. So, yeah, it's ancient. It's a 57 Chevy. When you Guess what kind of computers we had? We didn't have any computers. Right, right. We didn't right. Have any you had stuff. an abacus. You had an abacus yeah. and Walter. <laughs> it was pretty basic, but. The way that the inlet system worked and all was the real secret and the real genius of Ben Rich and Kelly Johnson. And the, the jet they said couldn't be done, they figured out a way to do it. And it lasted for a quarter of a century. It helped win the Cold War, did more to protect this country you'll, than you'll ever know. Uh, and stands alone and it still holds every record to this day. So they did That's something. Amazing. Did, did you totally random, and I know we keep going over here, but did you ever get into any of these? Because like one thing that I don't know if it's a great idea or not, who the hell knows, because much smarter people than I, uh, but typically fighter jets um, for the armed forces were very specialized. That's why you got the Viper and the Hornet, one for long takeoffs, short takeoffs, carrier takeoffs, et cetera. And you had all these different types of planes. And now we have one plane, the F-35, that does everything. Uh, have, you, have you ever been in the F-35? Do you like do you really think that one airplane can do everything? I'm sorry? Do you really think one airplane can do everything? Look, I wouldn't know because I don't claim to but know. Even not body. knowing, even even not knowing just that sentence, do you think that, that one airplane can do everything? 
I would guess not because I would guess. I would say you were very intelligent then because <laughs> no, it's just an incredible technology, and the problem is we often ask our airplanes to do way more than they should. We did that with the F four for years, and uh, so it's it's the jack of all trades and master none. But the cost of these airplanes now and the uh, the problems that they have with them, I, I just am not a believer in that F-35 quite yet. It's uh, right, still right. got to prove itself to me. Look at the F-22. That was supposed to be the end all of do all. You don't even hear about it anymore. It's just a kind of an air superiority. A lot of people think that we'll never fight wars like that again anyway. It'll be all satellite, you know, laser. Right, right. All drones and stuff. Drones. That's what... Yeah, that's what Maverick says in Top Gun, you know, like. Well, and it probably will be, and then that might be might be better, you know, in a way. But, uh, you know, history goes through cycles and everything. We reach such high tech thing. The one thing that makes me laugh so much in the Star Wars movie is you get all this high tech of million years in the future and all. They're, they're, they're shooting guns like they're water pistols and then missing and. <laughs> kill him instantly with a laser right gun. right right the bullets would never miss first of all you're I i've know. never thought about that and that's brilliant uh, that, I, I, it, that far in the future they would have developed look, bullet and their, and their, clothing, their clothing that they're wearing they're wearing <laughs> rag from the from the uh goodwill a million years ago. <laughs> what, what, what happened to civilization here that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Brian, I'd love to have you back on one day. I'd love to keep supporting you. So please let me know if you're ever in Florida. Um, well, here's uh, there's beautiful be photography here to be had. Uh, I, I go to Florida all the time to shoot birds. My parents used to live there. I, I'm well aware. Here's what you can do for me. Yeah. Uh, I've been approached by several uh, movie people that they want to do the branch story and everything. And, and we agreed that it, it work better if I do the book first because then they have some sort of blueprint to go on instead of just just flying out there with a, a stupid Top Gun movie. Um, so uh, you want to do something for me? You, you talk to talk to your Hollywood uh, uh, movie movie people that are serious, not these people making all these little you know handmade movies on the sidewalk. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's a filmmaker now. Right, know? right, right. Yeah, um, you know, because people story, show up to your house with an iPhone. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Put the black the story, like this. <laughs> the, the story, if it's done right, really would make a good movie. And I've talked to serious people, seriously talked to Hollywood people uh, more than once about it. And we've had long meetings. They came up here for a week at a, a whole week. And uh, so it's just a matter of finding the right person who believes enough in it uh, to say, yeah, that would be a real motion picture, not just another Yahoo. Uh, Look, and I think the, the other very important thing, um, first of all, it would be an honor to, to consider that. Um, but the really important thing is to also find somebody who's willing uh, to stay true to your story. Well, that's not, what I'm saying. It's very hard to find that because I've been approached by some people where I just go, no, stop. You got the wrong idea. We're, yeah. not, doing a, we're not making a, a fiction version of this, uh, you know, just to put the airplane on screen and, and do, uh, do the... Um, uh, 3D. Uh, right, it's really a story about overcoming yeah, adversity. It's, that it's not over yeah. until it's over. That's what it's the really about. Is, uh, the airplane is a vehicle to tell a broader story, and it could yes. be really a good story and well done. So uh, the airplane know. just makes it accessible, right? It's like okay. when it's like when uh, Shakespeare well, uses it's, action. It's, you know, that's for, right. That's the entertaining part of the movie, and right. and, and it's. It's actually two stories of the birth of that airplane and, and the rebirth of uh, the one man who was least likely to ever fly. Yeah, yeah. Somebody in my own age group, you know, which uh, right. feels great. Um, so if, if you're 48, that means that you were born three years before me. So 73 was when the, this all went down? Uh, yeah, 73, 74. Yeah, yeah 73, 74. Awesome. Major, thank you so much for your time, for your service, for your brilliance and for your wisdom. Um, I'm a big fan. Like I said, like I'm not even like I'm listening to your to your speeches randomly in the background sometimes just to remind myself that, you know, life um, is, is what you make it. You know, They'd like um, it's exactly what you said, you know, and like, you know, uh, as long as you don't lose hope, you can do anything uh, you want. You know, well, you that's very important. What you can do, you know. 
Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm going to go off the air. Stay on with me. I want to chat with you for two seconds, but thank you so much, guys. Brian Schull, sleddriver.com. And um, I'll put all the links below. Um, you can you know, find this on you know, Apple, uh, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, all over the place. The only this other thing, uh, where, place I would send them is uh, Brian Schull Photography uh, slash Facebook. Uh, we've run a commentary of this Harrier family for the last two months, and with the uh, with the uh, and, and, and it's, you know, sorry to keep going here, but when you say Harrier, because I'm actually quite familiar with with by you know with uh, animals, and you know, like I said, I've done formal nature documentaries. The Harrier, I'm not familiar with the Harrier. Is that a type Harrier of falcon? Like is like a hawk, but he's the one that's down low to the ground and, and uh, usually has his wings in a V. Uh, they they have a little radar owl type looking face so they look different than the hawks they're a little smaller uh but they are just amazing hunters uh down low and uh grab that little rodent and uh, i just and, find and, and do they cool. hover like 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 do yeah, they they hover? yes they, they will hover they're, they're the ballerinas of the uh fighter pilots of the uh field out there so so like they I use the, yeah, the updrafts and like the uh thermals to like stay up and yeah but they're really good down low and uh I, I don't do Facebook, but I have a, a guy doing my photography on there who's, uh, we did a whole story of each day we're waiting for the chicks to hatch. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like they're going to. They had a, a, a deer or a coyote attack their nest and everything because they nest on the ground. But anyway, if people uh, like like nature images of the birds, uh, they'll, I think they'll like this. We, get, we, we went from 300 followers to uh, 10,000. In, in a couple of months. So, so. Oh, wow, wow. So hopefully we can send some folks over there. Brian Schull Photography forward Thank slash you. Facebook. There you go. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, guys. See you on the next one.